Thank you, and, and good morning. I start, uh, as, as Michael said, on the trade side. Trade performance, national trade performance, is heavily impacted by, trade, by tax policy. That sounds like such a truism, but historically that connection has been ignored or certainly undervalued uh, by U.S. lawmakers as we put together our tax policy. We've done tax policy in a, in a, to a large extent as if the rest of the world didn't exist. So I thank uh, Economy and Crisis and Coalition for Prosperous America uh, for putting these programs together. It's a real service uh, to bring attention to the looming ta uh, choices that we have on tax policy uh, and putting them in a broader uh, national perspective. I'm going to lay out, and this is a little artificial, but for, forgive me, it's not really a Letterman uh, type uh, presentation, but uh, uh, I'm going to lay out 10 common sense reasons why a consumption tax must be part of any effective, lasting tax reform. Uh, I'm going to use very few numbers, but I hope to use uh, some pertinent facts and, uh, and good logic. Reason number one. Uh, we need to ensure that imports pay their fair share of taxes. Today, imports get a free, tax-free ride into the U.S. market. In effect, the U.S. government has issued an invitation to American uh, producers to outsource production, not for quality reasons, not for labor cost reasons, not to get access to raw materials, but for purely tax savings reasons. The one exception to the case that Ben talked about, he talked about B2B taxation. There's one area where that doesn't work, and that's when you're outsourcing. If you import your, your, raw, your raw material, your, your component, or your finished good that you're selling, you're getting that without the foreign tax. So that's the one exception to the B2B problem that Ben mentioned. Second reason, it's the other side of that coin. Uh, we need to end the double taxation of U.S. exports, right? It's a maxim uh, revered in America that the power to tax is the power to destroy. Well, when you double tax your exports, it can't be good for them. Double taxation of our exports, in other words, we're taxing, when, a, when we export a good, it's got the U.S. tax embedded in it, and when it arrives in a foreign jurisdiction, they apply their own consumption tax, 150 plus countries do that. So double taxation of our exports makes us uncompetitive against all other exports that benefit from their own border tax adjustments. We're, we're competing against German or Canadian or Mexican or Chinese or Japanese goods anywhere in the world. We're at a disadvantage, and pretty much uniquely at a disadvantage. Double taxation of our exports makes exporting unattractive to, um, to many U.S. producers, and therefore it reduces the investment they make to create capacity for export. And double taxation of our exports subverts the President's National Export Initiative, which is, in our view, already an incomplete and inadequate, really wrong-headed objective. Not that it's bad, but it doesn't address the problem. But it makes that objective harder to attain and the benefits harder to realize. So putting those first two reasons together, the third reason, there's no way to rebalance our trade Without doing this, that is a, a, that's where we start uh, in the CPA. Uh, that's our, our number one objective, is to rebuild our economy by rebalancing trade. You can't do that uh, unless you have a consumption tax, in our view. The annual two-way burden on U.S. trade, that is the, the foreign government rebate of their taxes on exports to the United States, plus the foreign government imposition of taxes on U.S. exports to them, it, it amounts to about $500 billion a year. All right, that's a staggering sum. By contrast, the Exim Bank lending is capped at $100 billion a year. Uh, the International Trade Administration unit of the Department of Commerce, which has a broad mandate in international trade areas, their annual budget is $520 million. And we're talking about $500 billion each and every year. So even if there were no pressure to stabilize and reduce government spending, which of course there is, but even if there were not, there's no amount of increased government support for trade that could remotely approach the magnitude of foreign border tax adjustments. This is so big that it, 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 it is a structural impediment to and distortion of 
U.S. trade. It is our number one trade problem in my view. The fourth reason is it is a historical reason. The last time we had a major tax uh, reform, 1986, we failed, and I, I think Ben mentioned some of uh, President Reagan's uh, aversion to consumption taxes. We did not, we considered, but we did not ad adopt a consumption tax at that point. Um, so what happened as a result of that? We, we, well, instead, what we did was we tried to do, and does this sound familiar? We wanted to reduce income tax rates, and we wanted to close loopholes. Right? At one point, actually, that bill was called the Tax Simplification Act. Um, I think in the end they took that word out. But that was the, the notion, a very similar to what's being discussed now, lower rates and uh, tighter, tighter uh, loopholes. And the explicit objective when it came to international competitiveness was to reduce our marginal corporate tax rate, then about almost 50 percent, to 35 percent, where it, it has remained ever since. Uh, that took us from being the second highest marginal corporate tax rate in the OECD countries to the second lowest. And we enjoyed that uh, benefit for a few years. And let me just jump ahead to this. It's, this is going to be hard to see. The red line is the number of countries using some form of consumption tax. And you'll see that the rate of adoption swings up sharply after 1986. That is the time at which the rest of the world leapfrogged the American tax reform. They did the kind of reform that Ben and, and in the previous program, Michael Stumo and Michael Gratz talked about. That's the, that's the reform they did. They introduced or they expanded their consumption tax, they reduced their corporate tax rates. And that red line is the evidence of the rate at which they do it, and that's how we got to the current 150 or so countries. The blue line is the annual U.S. Uh, trade deficit, the balance in goods. And you can see that with a little lag, uh, our trade deficit, which had improved uh, during the uh, early 90s, uh, it turned sharply lower as some of, there, there are obviously many factors going on, but this is one factor that's constant throughout the whole period. As the benefits of those tax changes took place, the U.S. You know, has suffered a huge deterioration in our trade performance. And I would note that happened without China being a factor at all. all right? This is driven largely by our uh, tax discrepancy. So we lost in that last tax reform, we lost on the export side, we lost on the import side, and we also lost on the location of corporate activities. Remember, one of the arguments for lower marginal rate for corporations is that they will then locate in and do R&D activities in the countries that offer them the best rates. Well, other people were offering them lower uh, corporate tax rates at the same time as they offered them protection in the import market and the subsidy when they exported. So the 1986 tax reform from this perspective was disastrous. Reason number five, everybody, and I, I try to underscore here, everybody does it. Right? It's already been said, 150 countries, and we often overlook this. American Samoa has a 15% value-added tax. Oh, I wasn't going to use that word, <laughs> but they have a 15% VAT, right? 150 countries have it, and we don't. We are the only significant producer of anything, agricultural or manufactured, that does not have some form of consumption tax. So this puts us in a very select group of countries. People like the six Gulf Cooperation Council states, most of whom are considering a, a, a change in their tax system today, Libya, the Turks and Caicos, Bahamas, Maldives, Brunei, and you know what they export, and the Vatican. And there are one or two other <laughs> island countries, but that's it. If you make something, anything, if you grow it or you produce it in a factory, you've got some kind of consumption tax and there's a reason for it. It gives you a huge, not only is it an efficient tax, it gives you a huge benefit in your trade performance and a huge penalty if you don't ad adopt it. Your trade performance will suffer. Everybody figure that out but us. Even our free trade partners, all of U.S. free trade partners except Oman and Bahrain, which are two of the countries that are thinking about actually changing their tax system. Every one of those 
has a consumption tax, most of them adopted in conjunction with the negotiations with the United States. As Canada changed their system to improve it. Mexico adopted the VAT uh, just before uh, they con we concluded NAFTA. The uh, CAFTA countries uh, also introduced a value-added tax as they were getting ready to, what? Negotiate away their tariffs. So they substituted uh, a tax for tariff at the border, and they got the benefit of uh, a legal, uh, I jumped myself, of, of a subsidy to exporters um, when uh, goods leave their, their country. Okay, so everybody does it, we're the odd man out. But wait a minute, aren't, aren't export subsidies illegal? Right, under the GATT and the WTO way back to the 1940s, they're prohibited, right? Well, except when you've agreed otherwise. And that's what we've done. And actually, we did this a long time ago. The Treasury Department created this doctrine around 1897. Um, it ruled that the non-excessive, to be very precise, the non-excessive rebate of indirect taxes, taxes on a good, consumption tax, in other words, not an income tax, uh, non-excessive rebates are legally acceptable and will not be subject to countervailing duties. All right. We've tried repeatedly to find a way within the GATT and WTO rules to defer income, on, income taxes on exports. We've had the DISC and the FISC and the ETI, and we've lost, right? Three strikes and we're out. This, case, this issue has gone to the Supreme Court in the 1970s, the Zenith uh, color television case. The Supreme Court upheld the 1897 doctrine of the Treasury Department. So it looks unlikely that this is a, if there's any way to, to fix this within U.S. courts. The choice for us is really simple. Since we can't beat them, we have to join them. Now, I'm gonna, that's, that's my trade case. Uh, and it's, it, it, I did it quickly and uh, superficially, but I uh, hope we have plenty of time to, to discuss. Uh, on the macro side, I would emphasize a few things that Ben has has mentioned and Michael Gratz mentioned before him, but I might make some of these points a little bit differently. And what I'm trying to get across is that on the trade side, we have a single economic imperative. We must do some form of consumption tax at a competitive rate in order to succeed as a trading country. On the macro side, we have more choices. And that's what I'm trying to, to get to here. Reason number seven, though, which Ben already mentioned, is uh, we have a significant, saving and significant and persistent savings deficit in this country. Um, despite the fact that if you go through our code, there are many provisions of the tax code uh, that are designed to incentivize uh, per personal savings. But the results have been meager, and they've been meager for a long time. By contrast, a consumption tax creates a simple, direct, universally accessible incentive not to overspend your discretionary income. So that you don't have to go through all of the you know, conditions, preconditions, limitations that we find when we have uh, a lot of our retirement uh, savings programs. A lot of people are ineligible for them uh, for different reasons. This, everybody would have it in their power on, on Friday night to decide, you know what, we're staying in and we're gonna save the money and not pay the tax. That's a personal choice within the power of each person who has discretionary income. And it works even when interest rates are low, even when interest rates are negative because of the tax savings, there's a positive benefit up to, you have to very negative uh, rates. Uh, there's, there's an incentive that exists even in times like these when it's very difficult to get any kind of return on your money. Number eight, and this sounds like, this sounds like a Republican point. The Repub one of the Republican objectives in the current tax reform uh, cons debate is to broaden the tax base. Well, there's nothing, no tax base broader than consumption, right? Doesn't matter where the income came from, whether it's earned income, unearned income, I know some people don't like, don't like that word, uh, long-term capital gain, short-term capital gain, Inherited money wouldn't matter. It matter. All that matters is that you spent it. If you spend it, then uh, it's taxed. So illegal immigrants, the underground economy, God knows how large it is, but uh, judging from my neighborhood, it's pretty substantial. Um, 
everybody would pay. You have, if, you go, if you go and buy anything, if you need anything, then you pay as you buy. And it wouldn't matter how, how much effort you put into avoiding income taxes, you'd still pay at the checkout counter. Now, getting into, I want to mention regressivity, um, the ninth point. And this is um, a, a plus and a minus. Regressivity is a problem in, in tax reform. And Ben has already mentioned, there is there's some debate about how regressive a consumption tax is. It depends on a lot of factors, but it's hard to argue that it's not regressive uh, by its nature. You can, you can deal with that problem, and that's the point. Adding it to our tax system would force us to deal with the problem of regressivity. And that, I think, is the way that opens up uh, the road to a much an, an overall fair uh, you know, package that is politically acceptable. This is where you get into the whole range of, of options. You could have lower rates uh, on, on income. You could have higher deductions. You could have fewer exemptions. You could have a higher zero rate of the consumption tax. You could have multiple rates. Um, ben mentioned already tuition, health care. Um, you could also, the resale of houses could be a, at a zero rate. So you tax it the first time, but after that, uh, every, every transaction is, uh, is at a zero rate. Groceries, many states do this with their sales tax. You wouldn't have to tax groceries. Uh, clothing under a certain value, many states also do this. That could be zero rated. There's a big range of choice here to deal with the problem of regressivity. And as you do that, you get into the rest of it, okay? And note my words here, done right, all right? A fundamental tax reform, which means including a, a consumption tax and making the balancing changes in the rest of the system, it could increase the efficiency and fairness of our tax system. It could reduce the cost of compliance and enforcement. It could narrow the scope for evasion and avoidance. It could provide taxpayers with much more control of their tax payments. April 15th would be pretty much one day on the calendar. Uh, you pay as you go. Uh, and it would re reduce the scope for an intrusive, abusive, or incompetent Internal Revenue Service. Done right, such a reform would also give the U.S. tax system, would give the U.S.A. tax system worthy of a major power in the 21st century. We are limping along with the world's worst tax system. It has no, nothing to recommend it, except that it's difficult to change. And done right, such a reform would be a major component of an effective national trade and economic strategy to promote investment and production in the United States and to make American-made goods cost competitive in the home and world markets, which is the fundamental point for the CPA. So in conclusion, my, my sense of this is, is really pretty simple. Either we adopt such a reform, or we must accept the inevitability of an erosion of our standard of living and our stature as a world leader. For me, that's an easy choice to make. So thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.